Michael Williams, does the pivot mark a major moment in history? Is the pivot really a final moment in the final chapter of the Cold War as the US turns away from Europe and engages fully with Asia? I certainly hope it is. Um, it's certainly going to take some time to tell, and I think in the next five years, obviously, are the uh, uh, critical ones. You referred at the beginning to uh, the pivot and turning away from Europe towards Asia. Uh, that is happening. What's more difficult from the United, for the United States, I think, as the global superpower, is to move away the resources uh, and attention that it gives to the Middle East uh, and focus those on Asia. Because so many of the world's problems are still in that terrain between Gaza and the Khyber Pass. And I'm afraid that that's not going to weigh, going to go away, and is going to dilute some of the attention and importance that the, attach can, uh, the US can attach to uh, Asia. The pivot is a US response to the tensions, to the dangers in Asia. But is the pivot also helping to drive those tensions? There is that risk. Uh, the pivot, of course, is a recognition of the importance of this part of the world, and not just the importance, but of the primacy of Asia-Pacific now in the global economy. That has changed uh, away from the Euro-Atlantic, and I think it has changed uh, for the long term. So in, in that sense, on an economic basis, the US is recognizing the importance of uh, all the countries, including China, so critical for the US economically. But we saw in uh, President Obama's speech here in November 2011 before the uh, Australian Parliament, at the same time he was critical of China and uh, strikingly said that some historical systems have failed and uh, spoke openly then of fascism on the one hand and communism uh, on the other. So you have, uh, if you like, an economic pivot in a positive sense, engaging with the entire region, including China, but there's also a strategic pivot which is not embracing China and is very concerned about China's growing assertiveness. And that's really what is concerning many people, particularly in Southeast Asia, that the strategic pivot is heavily military in its flavour, and that is about confronting China. Yes. Um, now, in the best of situations, and I think the intent is there in uh, Washington and the White House and the State Department and elsewhere, uh, it, it should not just be a military pivot that you talk, talked about, but also a pivot in, in other ways. A diplomatic pivot, for example, to see the US more active here than perhaps uh, in Europe, but also bringing economic resources in. But it's still being seen too much in, in military terms. It's being seen too much in military terms, and one of my concerns is that you know, the US has its own economic problems. Uh, financial constraints. Uh, the president finds it difficult to get his way in Congress. Uh, all these are, are, are going to contribute to, to perhaps making the pivot too focused on the strategic military element. By making the commitment that the US has and making it so publicly and strongly, does the US risk a moral hazard? Because what the US is doing means that the Philippines or Japan or even Vietnam might be more robust themselves in confronting China. because they think that they've got US backing. There is an element of that. There's a danger of that. Um, and some people argue that you know, the ASEAN countries at their summit in Cambodia last year took it too far, if you like, because they felt it was some sort of green light from uh, Washington. But uh, I have to say, I have some sympathy for the Japanese on the one hand and the Vietnamese on the other. Maritime issues are difficult. I mean, there are parts of the North Sea that the UK and Norway have not defined. But we are friends with the Norwegians, so it doesn't really matter. The problem here is that China's uh, assertiveness is worrying everyone from, from Tokyo to Jakarta. How alarmed are you about what we are seeing in the East China Sea and the South China Sea? We're having our leaders 
talking about Balkans analogies and phrases like tinderbox and powder keg are now being publicly used. How worried should the region be that its, uh, its moment of history might be actually a confrontation with history? Uh, I, I, I hope not, but that potential is, is there. And I was very struck yesterday by an interview that Kurt Campbell, the outgoing Assistant Secretary of Defence, gave to one of, the, one of your newspapers where he talked about East Asia in particular being a powder keg. Uh, for somebody who, who served in, in the heart of Washington, as it were, for the past several years, that, that's very worrying. And I do distinguish, particularly at the moment, between East Asia and the South China Sea. Uh, in the South China Sea, the issues are there. In the East Asia Sea, East China Sea, it's China confronting Japan. We know their past history. And Campbell talked about that as, a, as white knuckle diplomacy. I mean, people are getting pretty, pretty scared when diplomats are starting to clench their, clench their knuckles. I, I, exactly. And you know Chinese and Japanese warships, military aircraft, are circling each other in that region. And uh, there is the potential there, even without the intent, which I don't think is there, of some awful incident and some sort of collision. God forbid, but, th but that possibility is clearly there at the moment. Is there any role at all for the United Nations? You've talked about the possibility of, of a good officer's role for the Secretary General in, uh, in the South China Sea. Does the UN have, have anything to offer? I think the, the UN does. Some would say that you know, the UN does because who else? Uh, you know, Indonesia has tried it in its own way, but, but Indonesia is a key member of ASEAN. Uh, there was some talk, I think the Lowy Institute suggested uh, that perhaps Australia takes this on, which is difficult for uh, Australia above all because of its close ties with uh, the, the United States. Now, the UN can in theory take anything on, and you don't need the approval of the Security Council for this. The Secretary General can decide uh, that a situation is of concern and he can use his good offices. But that still requires the goodwill of two parties. You and I agree on something. Uh, and it would be a very hard sell to China. Taking the words from my mouth, uh, my, I, my, my sense is that that's a direction China does not want to go into. Michael Williams, thank you very much. My pleasure, Graham.